My name is Quentin Goodbody. I'm president of the Ladysmith and District Historical Society. Thanks for coming this afternoon. Today, we're very lucky to have Mark Edge, who's going to talk to us about the post-media effect, how vulture capitalism is wrecking our news. Mark is a Canadian journalist, author, academic, and sailor. He has uh, a breathtaking resume. <laughs> From 1974 to 1993, Mark was a reporter and copy editor for the Vancouver Province and Calgary Herald. After taking early retirement at 38, <laughs> yeah. Not wow. I think it was just a change of career, actually. <laughs> He fulfilled a long-time dream by sailing to the South Pacific aboard his 40-foot catch, Markinur. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah, pretty good. He then studied for his doctorate and has taught at universities in five countries. Mark has published seven books focused on the news industry. In his latest book, the subject of today's talk, Mark focuses on post-media a Canadian media conglomerate which reportedly effectively concentrates more than 90% of all Canadian dailies and weeklies in one company. This should set off alarm bells with regards to potential control of our news content and the direction, potentially, of our democracy. Today, Mark talks about how post media's pursuit of profit has affected and is affecting newsrooms and the quality of reporting. Mark, thank you very much. I've been saving that all week. Uh, and uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction, um, Quentin. Um, obviously, you've done your research, but then again, there's a lot of stuff out there, not only about post media, but also about me, because I have my own website in which I've chronicled all of my research and my uh, sailing adventures. Um, I just want to point out that the 90% figure might be a bit high. It depends on how you measure it. That's why I said reported. Yes, <laughs> because there is a lot of, like I say, misinformation out there. And I, I put it at, at about 40% of all newspapers in Canada, but they have 15 of the 21 largest newspapers. So that's about um, five sevenths, so three quarters. Um, so it's a lot. Uh, the largest newspapers from coast to coast, let's just put it this way, except for the Globe and Mail, the Toronto Star, uh, the Winnipeg Free Press, are all owned by Post Media. The National Post, which we get, we get here, Vancouver Sun and Province, both Calgary Papers, both Edmonton Dailies, both Saskatchewan Dailies, uh, Ottawa Citizen, Montreal, Gazette, you name it, they own uh, what used to be the, the former uh, Southern newspaper chain. Question, how many of you are aware that for the last five years the federal government has been bailing out the newspaper industry to the tune of $595 million? Again, about half the, half the audience. So these are not well-known facts. It's not something that the mainstream media will be reporting on. To learn about this stuff, you have to read books like mine, <laughs> okay? Um, and yes, the uh, five-year bailout is ending this year. So Bill C-18 is designed to force Google and Facebook to continue the bailout because Ottawa is tired of paying. But that might uh, not work either because they both said that they're, they're not going to be used as a piggy bank for Canada's uh, news media. So things could get very interesting very shortly, and I'll just give you the, the cut to the chase, the conclusion of my book is that Post Media last year reached a tipping point at which they are losing money by the boatload, uh, only $13 million in profit last year, almost $10 million of which came from federal subsidies. It comes nowhere near uh, covering their debt payments, which come to more than $30 million a year, and the debt absurdly is held mostly by the same U.S. hedge funds, which own 98% of the company. So what it is, it's a scam, okay? They're working a scam on us, and I, I'm saying the only way to get rid of these hedge funds is to let the thing go boom and uh, crash and burn and see what we can salvage from the wreckage. 
Anyway, uh, as I was mentioning, uh, the post media effect is the third in a trilogy which began a long, long time ago, uh, 22 years ago. Uh, my first book was on Pacific Press, which is the illegal monopoly, so ruled in 1957. <laughs> um, illegal monopoly uh, that has owned the Vancouver newspapers since 1957. This was my dissertation at Ohio University. And I had this, it's out of print, but I have some copies. If anybody wants one, I'd be happy to inscribe one of those for you as well. Um, but as an academic history, uh, it had to end at least 10 years in the past to qualify. So my end point was 1991, when the Vancouver Sun moved from afternoon to morning publication in so-called competition with the Morning Province, which I used to write for. <laughs> The comic book, we called it. It was, a, it was a real newspaper when I started on it. Dave worked there too, he's laughing. <laughs> but it, uh, they went tabloid in 1983. It's a long story. Anyway, uh, by 2007, uh, by 2007, Conrad Black, you probably heard of him, <laughs> had taken over the former Southern newspapers, which I used to work for. And then at the millennium, passed it along to Izzy Asper, who owned Canwest Global Communications. This was the supposed media miracle of convergence. Newspapers and television, this was the way of the future. Well, how long did that last? Uh, not, not 10 years. And uh, as, uh, Can West went uh, bust in about uh, 2010, 20, uh, 2009, and it was scooped up out of bankruptcy by the hedge funds despite a supposed 25% limit on foreign ownership of our newspapers in Canada, they got around this by um, starting a new publicly traded company called Post Media Network, of which they uh, then owned 92%, now they own 98%, but they get around the law by claiming that the company is actually supposedly controlled by its Canadian shareholders, because the foreign shareholders, their shares are limited in voting power. And if you believe that, I've got a bridge I'd like to sell you. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, you can see here that uh, uh, my uh, dissertation did win an award, the American Journalism Historians Association Award uh, uh, for the best dissertation that year. And some people had some nice things to say about Asper Nation as well. We're still waiting for the first, well, actually the second review of uh, the post media effect because uh, Marshall Souls kindly wrote one in uh, this month's uh, Take Five magazine, which of course you can pick up anywhere, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, my other books, just briefly, I've, uh, as Quentin mentioned, I've written seven books total. One was actually not on the media, it was on hockey. Or, or the labor economics thereof. <laughs> I got interested in, uh, uh, it's funny, I wrote two books on newspaper companies without hardly even cracking a financial statement, and then I took a, a course in how to read financial statements, and I've been on this avenue of research ever since. Uh, 2014, I did a comprehensive review of all of the financials of all of the publicly traded newspaper companies in Canada and the U.S., I wrote a book called Greatly Exaggerated, The Myth of the Death of Newspapers, because newspapers are not dying, they're just getting smaller <coughs> and smaller and smaller. And they might be fading away, but then again, they might be transitioning quite successfully to a, a new life online, because of course, after all, that's supposed to be the way of the future, right? Maybe yes, maybe no. I still believe that there's a place for print newspapers. Um, according to the publisher of the Globe and Mail, the print edition is still making an 18% profit margin, which if you try and buy a copy today, you will learn it's $7 for the Saturday uh, <laughs> Globe. They're, they're charging you full price now. There's no more discounting copy sales, okay, to get... To get uh, more readers. And then 2016, I wrote a book called The News We Deserve, was mostly a compilation of my academic 
journal articles, but it also focused on the 2015 federal election in which the Liberals, of course, ousted the ruling Conservatives of Stephen Harper for 10 years, despite the best efforts of Post Media Network, which ordered all of its editors to endorse the Conservatives all across the country. And um, most recently I've written a book on the UK newspaper industry, um, an academic book called Re-examining the UK Newspaper Industry, very exciting. And it shows the same thing happening there. Newspapers are transitioning quite nicely to hybrid online print publications. The uh, Times of London now, of course, uh, owned by Rupert Murdoch. Their earnings have been doubling every year for the past several years, ever since the pandemic started. Uh, I think they're now up to about 90 million pounds a year. But that didn't stop old Rupert from crying poverty to the government during the pandemic to, be, to plead to be released from his 1981 undertaking to keep the Times and Sunday Times separate. He, he talked about how their copy sales were going down, their advertising sales were going down. Made no mention of how their online subscriptions are going through the roof and their online advertising revenues going up. And like I say, so uh, there uh, you have to. Uh, what I do now is I go right to the financial reports because you can certainly cannot trust what they what they tell you. Certainly not in the newspaper. Okay, so. The bottom line of the post-media effect, which, by the way, I didn't choose that title. I wanted to call it Media Parasite. <laughs> <laughs> but my publisher said, oh, that didn't test very well with our uh, reps. So we had to come up with a new title. And so he hung this one on me, the post-media effect, perhaps not realizing that media effects are a thing in, in the scholarly world. So I had to come up with an actual effect of the post-media effect. So I call it the hollowing out of Canada's largest uh, and most influential newspapers by these foreign hedge funds that now own, like I say, 98% of the shares, but still somehow do not control the company because it's controlled by the 2% of Canadians who are shareholders. And what they've done, this, this is a scam they're working. What they did was while Can West was going broke, they kept issuing more high interest debt to desperately try and stay afloat, uh, some of which was at interest rates as high as 12.5%, uh, which the hedge funds, uh, this is one of their strategies, to, is to buy up uh, debt cheaply on the bond market, and apparently these hedge funds bought it uh, at prices as low as five to ten cents on the dollar. Which, if you buy a bond that pays twelve and a half percent at say ten cents on the dollar, it's just simple math that if you can keep that company alive and paying, your annual return will be one hundred twenty-five percent. This. This is the scam they're working. All they have to do is keep the company alive and sending interest payments south. So they've been bleeding the company dry. All newspapers have had to make layoffs, okay, because their advertising revenues have been going down more than a half now. It might be uh, as much as two thirds. But Post Media has had to make twice as many layoffs just to keep paying their debt to their foreign hedge fund owners. And uh, the other aspect of the post-media effect, the, as I call it, is the weaponizing of their remaining influence politically in Ottawa to get such favors, like I say, as the $595 million bailout, uh, the news media bailout in 2018 and now Bill C-18, which I think is going to backfire, because I don't think Google and Facebook are going to stand for this, uh, and they would have every right uh, not to. So the weaponizing of their remaining influence to continue feeding off the dying remains of our news media. So that's, that's why they call hedge funds vulture 
capitalists. They feed off the, the carcass, they pick it clean, and then they leave nothing behind. They sell off all the assets. Uh, okay, like I, I listed before, some of the post-media newspapers, um, they own most of the major uh, dailies across the country. And after they uh, took over um, uh, Can West, their newspaper division, the former Southern newspapers out of bankruptcy in 2010, then they bought the second largest newspaper chain in Canada, Sun Media, which owns the Sun tabloid chain across, or owned it across the country along with some broadsheets like the Hamilton Spectator and some others anyway. And uh, I argue that that's another purchase that not, should not have been allowed, and it was very bad timing. And it, 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 what it did was it showed the ineffectiveness of our Competition Act, the Competition Bureau, because all they had to do was show efficiencies in operation, i.e. they were going to lay off hundreds more journalists, and uh, under the Competition Act, that would outweigh any detriment to the public, which the Competition Bureau didn't even bother trying to put a number on for some reason, but anyway, uh, you, if you've been following what's been going on in competition in this country, you'll know that the Competition Bureau has been an utter failure, and even its new head has been calling for its reform to give it some teeth, because they have absolutely none now. So yes, 15 of the 21 largest newspapers in Canada now owned by Post Media. One thing about these hedge funds is you can't believe anything they say, okay? Because when they bought the Sun newspapers, people got a little bit nervous. They said, well, you're going to like merge the Calgary Herald with the Calgary Sun, or you're going to merge the Edmonton Journal with the Edmonton Sun, you're going to merge the Ottawa Citizen with the Ottawa Sun. They said, oh, no, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to keep separate newsrooms and keep competition alive. Well, what do you think happened two years later? They went and merged the newsrooms and laid off hundreds more journalists. Because, like I say, you can't believe a thing these people say. They're hedge funds! <laughs> They're not even people! <laughs> uh, and then they bought uh, Brunswick News. If any of you are from New Brunswick, any of the Brunswickers here, uh, you know all about the Irving family yeah. monopoly over newspapers, which they've had since like the 50s. And uh, it was a shocking announcement last year <laughs> that uh, Post Media was buying Brunswick News. I think it's four or five newspapers and uh, radio stations, weekly newspapers. Um, but what everybody missed was that actually most of the purchase price was actually paid in shares of Post Media. So it wasn't so much a purchase as a merger. And now, actually, the fourth generation Irving, Jamie, is uh, the chairman of the board of Post Media Network. So, yes, it, uh, the, uh, the vice just keeps growing tighter and tighter. The Torstar chain is now the second largest chain. They own the largest newspaper in Canada, the Toronto Star, and the largest chain in Ontario, Metroland, uh, Hamlin Spectator, London Free Press, lots and lots of weeklies. Uh, out here in BC, of course, we have a duopoly, which is not quite a monopoly because there's two owners, but Black Press, which is headquartered in Victoria, and Glacier Media, which is headquartered in Vancouver, have been carving up the province between themselves for the past oh, dozen years or so, trading newspapers back and forth and closing them to eliminate competition, so that now, on Vancouver Island, Black Press owns every community newspaper. All of the newspapers on the island are owned by Black Press, except for the Times Colonist in Victoria, which is owned by Glacier. And Black traded a lot of its newspapers to um, Glacier Media in the uh, Fraser Valley. So uh, Glacier has uh, monopolies there. And what, one of the examples that people often give of, of how newspapers are dying is the closure of the Nanaimo Daily News. How many of you remember the Nanaimo Daily News? Mm -hmm. 
closed in 2016, I think it was. Um, but it's funny, you know, uh, not too long ago there were actually three newspapers in, in, Victor in uh, Nanaimo. There was, they all ended up in the hands of Black, who all of a sudden had all three newspapers in Nanaimo, didn't need all three newspapers, didn't need competition, and so he folded uh, the daily and he folded the, the weekly. So now all you have is the, is the one newspaper in Nanaimo. So it's not newspapers that are dying, is my refrain. It's newspaper competition. Okay, because there's no money in competition. There's still money in monopoly. Okay. Oh, uh, where were we? We were in New Brunswick. Okay. I have a, an indictment here, the crimes of post media, the litany of grievances. Okay, not only have they laid off hundreds of journalists who make the payments on their debt, not only did they merge the newsrooms um, in four of Canada's largest cities despite promising not to, and by the way, in Vancouver, I can tell you from researching the history of the partnership Pacific Press there that this promise dates back to the 1957 founding of the company when the Restrictive Trade Practices Commission, as it was then, the competition regulator, after holding hearings in Ottawa and Vancouver, ruled it an illegal monopoly. And this was several years later, of course. Um, they said, okay, well, if you let us keep this illegal monopoly, here's what we'll do. We'll promise to keep separate newsrooms forever. So I guess we now know how long forever is. Because we're on hedge fund time now. Uh, when you open up your copy of the Vancouver Sun or the National Post and you see an interesting story there, it may be news, it may be a feature, or it may be advertising. Because what we have now is a lot of what's called native advertising, also called branded content, which is supplied by the advertiser. And uh, it's not there to inform you so much as to persuade you, okay, either towards a product or service or even, even just a, a way of thinking. So uh, they're supposed to put a little disclaimer on the top saying special advertising feature. Studies have shown that not only is that very hard to find often, people don't notice it and they usually can't tell the difference between native advertising, branded content, and real news content. Uh, oh, and the, the favorite example of this, you may have been uh, following for the past decade or so, they've had a partnership with the Canadian Alliance of Petroleum Producers, CAP, run endless features extolling the need for pipelines and, and oil tankers Pipelines to crisscross the province and oil tankers to ply the coast. And th this, is, this is paid, bought and paid for. Okay, it's paid for by the oil companies through their, through their uh, association uh, cap. Uh, the other thing about the post media newspapers is that, uh, well, you may have used to read the National Post and you gave it up because it's so right wing, right? <laughs> Okay, it was founded as a right-wing newspaper by Conrad Black because not only was he very right-wing, but there's actually not a lot of right-wing news in Canada, so there was a market for it, and that's fine. But since Black bought the Southern newspapers, uh, now Post Media is trying to impose the same hard right ideology on what were traditionally liberal newspapers, okay? The Sun newspapers, the tabloids, they were traditionally conservative, okay? But now, even the liberal newspapers, they're taking them to the right as a, a conscious marketing strategy, and that's something I deal with extensively in the book. Uh, it started under the former CEO, Paul Godfrey, who uh, recently retired, well, it's been a few years now, 
from the day-to-day -day operations, but he still, um, he was executive chairman of the board until Jamie Irving took over. Now he's a special consultant specializing in governmental relations. So what he's hoping to do, I'm sure, is steer home the latest bailout. He already got one worth $595 million. Well, this one, if it goes through and Google and Facebook pay up, it's estimated to cost them $329 million a year. A year. <coughs> anyway. Okay. So, yes, and uh, what irks me the most <laughs> from my research is going through all of the articles, the columns, the op-ed pieces in the post media newspapers. They have been unanimously, of course, in favor of, one, the bailout, two, Bill C-18, and how Google and Facebook are evil and are making too much money and should bankroll the Canadian newspaper industry. Uh, if you read the online commentary, it's much more balanced. In print, not so much. Oh yes, and uh, another example about <laughs> how you should never believe what these vultures say is when they were campaigning for the bailout, okay, they really put the heat on. What they did after the government uh, rejected their initial uh, ask of, I think it was 1.375 billion. What, the, what they did was Post Media and Torstar, who have been the two driving forces behind the bailout campaigns, they traded 41 newspapers, mostly in Ontario, uh, closed 36 of them, which caused a bit of consternation and a, quite a bizarre scene when the post-media executives began disclaiming, oh, we didn't know that they were going to close the newspapers that we traded to them. They don't tell us what we're doing, and we don't tell them what we're doing. So, but this didn't last very long because some investigative journalists at the TAI in Vancouver, the online uh, uh, news uh, publication, came up with actual memos, okay, uh, company memos that showed that they coordinated the layoffs, that they decided who was going to be laid off first. Well, if they didn't know the newspapers were going to be closed, well, how did they know they had to lay people off? So, finally, we got the Competition Bureau investigating. And investigating. And investigating. Years it went on. What do you think happened? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And they, they waited until <coughs> January the 6th, 2001, 2021, to announce very brief one-page press. You know what happened on January the 5th, don't you? And nobody noticed that one. So, yes, um, they lie through their teeth. They lie relentlessly. They, they, they lie as a matter of habit. This is what they do. They lie. Anything for money. Hedge funds, they're... Anyway, don't get me started. I guess I'm I guess I'm already started. Okay, and like I say, the scam that's going on with Post Media is the debt. Okay, uh, the debt was so enormous, like about 300 million, uh, that they almost went bankrupt about five years ago. And so Paul Godfrey, like I say, the former CEO, he had to pull some fancy footwork and he got the hedge funds to basically forgive about half of their debt uh, and gave them even more shares. That's how they got to 98%. Okay, but to keep the shell game going, okay, they had to take less every, every month. So, uh, but we are now at that point where the company's revenues and its earnings are not enough to cover its debt, so they're now having to sell off their assets. The Calgary Herald building was recently sold to the U-Haul company to make st uh, storage lockers out of. The Ottawa Citizen newsroom is going to be coming a roller skating rink this fall. <laughs> and all these journalists are going to have to work from home. This is the way of the future. Anyway, so um, they're, they're now underwater. If Bill 
uh, C18 doesn't go through, and uh, Google and Facebook don't start subsidizing, then then we'll have to again, of course, because that's where Ottawa gets its money is from from our tax dollars. Well, I'm saying that's not a very good use of our tax dollars. We should instead let this company go bust, okay, and then come up with a plan <laughs> for a better way to do this because the way it's been going uh, it hasn't been working. Anyway, stand by for that. So, uh, like I say, for more information, I have a website, which actually, um, you don't have to buy these books because you can download them for free. However, if you're old-fashioned, I have copies, and like I say, I'd be happy to sign one for you. Uh, so now, the only place I can get published is in Canadian Dimension magazine. Well, it used to be a magazine, founded in 1963, Canada's socialist magazine. Um, and I write about media. It's the only place that will publish my, my uh, articles. Uh, Michael Geist, if any of you uh, have been following him, he's a law professor at the University of Ottawa specializes in internet law and he's been following the recent uh, initiatives by Ottawa to regulate the internet basically with Bill C-11 now uh, Bill C-18 next <laughs> you won't believe this Bill C-36 okay that's coming they, they still haven't uh, been able to come up with language that's acceptable because what Bill C-36, the Online Harms Act, will do is regulate otherwise lawful speech. Okay? Mm. If you hurt somebody's feelings with something you post online, you could have a G-man come to your door, or, or, or more likely uh, get it taken down. This is, this is getting rather concerning, the overreach, <laughs> on the uh, part of the federal government. They left the internet alone for two decades, okay? We, we, we want to see how this is going to work out. And they've now decided it's not working out so well, so we're going to have to take a firm hand here. And Canada, unfortunately, is leading the world in internet regulation at the moment. And co countries like the UK and US are, are keeping a very close eye to see what happens with Bill C-18 because they have similar legislation pending in those countries, many countries around the world, so. And uh, I think if people, uh, you know, Canadians find out what's going on, they wouldn't approve. So you need to inform yourselves. You will not get the straight goods from the mainstream media, trust me. Okay, you need to go online and read people like Michael Geist and Canadian Dimension, and uh, by all means, read my new book. So I think that's about all I have to say.